it's about time I got around to doing another kit build. These are fun. Um, I enjoy doing them. And I've heard that you guys enjoy uh, seeing me do them. And uh, so that's what I'm going to do today. And the kit that I'm going to build is this one. Which is a waveform generator or function generator. Um, basically, well... Here's the schematic uh, with the description in typical Chinese. You can freeze frame that if you want to look at it. Okay. And here is the actual board. And it can output square waves, sawtooth waves, triangle waves, or sine waves. And they are all generated from a 555 timer, which of course creates square waves. And then the uh, components on here, specifically these resistor capacitor filter networks, will uh, filter out the high fre higher frequency harmonics from the square wave to leave behind the other waves. And the reason that works is going to need a little bit of a theory digression here. Um, I won't go too long or I won't go too deep, don't worry. So a square wave is basically made up of a bunch of different sine waves that are related to each other. Specifically, I mean, they're mathematically related. You could do the math. I'm not going to. I don't expect you to, but if you wanted to, you could. Um, so square waves are only, or contains components of odd integer harmonic frequencies. So, let's zoom in on this a little bit here. So, if we have a 1K fundamental, a 1K square wave, it will contain the odd harmonics. So, 3K, 5K, 7K, 9K, etc., all the way up in reducing amplitudes. So, to get rid of, or if you get rid of some of those harmonics, you will be left with just the fundamental as a sine wave. And how to do that is fairly straightforward actually and it's exactly how this circuit does it. Um, if we look here they're doing it with a 10 kilohertz uh, square wave. I'm not sure on the kit what frequency it is yet. Um, I suppose we could do the math or we could just build it and try it. But what they've got here is a three-stage resistive capacitive filter, an RC filter. And it just knocks out, uh, or it, it frequency selects basically um, based on the timing constant, the RC constant of this resistor capacitor combination, this one and this one. Notice that they're all the same 10 nanofarad capacitors in this case. And I'm guessing if we look at our circuit, we're going to find the same thing. So if you want more information, I'm going to link this web page and the Wikipedia page I was looking at earlier. If you want to go deeper into the math and the understanding of this, that's not what this video is about. It's not a uh, theory dump. So, I, But I just wanted to go over that as a brief introduction to why this thing works. So here's our schematic again, and we'll just look at it in chunks. There's the 555 timer, which is pretty much exactly like the other two 555 timer circuits that I've shown you in the past. It's set up as an A-stable multivibrator. Um, you can do the math. Um, where is the calculation? I don't have it handy. But it you you do the math between these two resistors, 1K and 15K, and a 473 nanofarad, I think it is, capacitor, I'm going to measure it um, so we can know for sure. So that's, actually, that part right there is the oscillator. That part is power supply filtering, a diode for reverse voltage protection, capacitor just to smooth it out a little bit. And then, um, after the 555, we have a little voltage divider that sends the square wave out through this capacitor out to J1. Uh, 
focus. J1 is where the square wave comes out. And then the rest of the square wave comes or from uh, the output of the 555 goes through this capacitor just as a DC block. And then there are three of those RC networks just like we saw in the uh, in the web page. However, these ones using 10K resistors and again a 473 capacitor, which again, I'm going to measure them to, to see exactly what they are. 473 is the code on them. I'm, I don't have that memorized. That's too many things for my wee brain. Okay, so after those three, and so the second one goes out to J2 after the first uh, RC uh, network. The second one goes out to J3 after there, and J2 and J3 are the sawtooth and triangle waves. And the last one goes through these two um, sorry, goes through these two uh, transistors set up as amplifiers, uh, DC block capacitor and an output um, a voltage divider. That's potentiometer set up as a voltage divider. And then out. I'll dump out all the components. I'm pretty confident that we've got them all. Not going to get too carried away. Uh, Two transistors, chip and socket, 4.7 microfarad capacitor, another 4.7 microfarad capacitor. So one of those is power supply filter. One of them is DC block on the output. Potentiometer, three resistors of that value, three of that value, two of that value, a couple of individual resistors. Um, there's that DC block capacitor on the for the input power supply. Um, looks like we got a bunch of different uh, capacitors. That one's different. That one's different. Those two are the same. One little suitcase jumper plug. And another resistor that is unique. So... And because, as I've said before, my eyes suck in general at colors and specifically with these stupid little resistors that have the blue background. So I'm going to check them with either my voltmeter or my handy dandy little tester here. Um, voltmeter, ohmmeter, multimeter, just to make sure I got what I think I've got. But I am going to start first, as I usually do with the least likely to be damaged components, which in this case, it's header pins and the IC socket. Then I'll probably go to resistors, ceramic capacitors, um, pot and the transistors and diode last, unless there's some mechanical reason to do otherwise. So I need these header pins into pairs. Okay, that's a problem. Those ones are somewhere underneath a pile of crap. Important safety tip. Um, no, not safety tip, important tip. Guard them against launching. Excuse me. Fortunately, I have a drawer full of header pins so I can just grab a couple that are left over from something else. Chop them off to replace the ones that I launched into the stratosphere. And we can get back to it. So DC voltage in. Ah. Okay. Oh. Output. These fit relatively tight, so I shouldn't have to hold them with any kind of magic when I flip the board over. I stand, once again, corrected. 
Um, okay, I need one more set for there. Now then, I flip that guy up. Okay. Okay. New plan. The new plan is blue tack or generic clone thereof from, as always, my local dollar store. Now this stuff isn't all that great with heat. It might get a little bit soft and squidgy. Not bothered. Cheap dollar store stuff, remember? There, that's holding. Oh, yeah, something I didn't mention. I am going to be soldering this with my brand new, fresh from eBay, soldering station. I have never before in my... 30 plus years of electronicsing had a temperature controlled iron. This guy I just unboxed off camera mostly, um, didn't seem to warrant its very own video, but uh, it cost me about 75 bucks off eBay. It was the cheapest one I could find. Um, surprisingly, it came from a Canadian seller. Um, even more surprisingly for a Canadian seller, it was free shipping and it has the iron and a hot air gun, which, which is designed for soldering surface mount. I'm not going to do that for a while on camera because I royally suck at it. I'm going to get some practice first. Um, yeah, I know you want to see me fail. Fine. Whatever. Nope. Not, ain't going to do it. Um, so we'll see if this can replace my previous Weller 35 watt or my even older Weller 25 watt that I had since I was a teenager. Um, this is, other than just making sure it works, this is pretty much the first time I've used that. So, we shall see how it goes. Having never had a uh, temperature controlled iron before, I've just randomly set this to 350 Celsius. And we'll see how it goes. Hmm. Might need to add a, make it a little bit hotter. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I am going to turn it up a little bit. Turn up to about 375. Again, this is new to me, being able to select the temperature of my iron. The other thing that might be holding me back a little bit is that uh, it does have a super fine tip, which is probably half the size of the tip that I had before. Uh, but it's, uh, it gets in there without causing any problems and get in between components and component leads. This is actually a bit of a torture test for it because I am soldering header pins. I right, created a bridge. Ancient desoldering vacuum bulb here. Literally, just a little rubbery bulb and Teflon tip to create some suction to pull that excess solder out. Again, that's as old as the hills. I do also have a, a proper vacuum desoldering pump and some wick, but I don't know, it just feels old school and I like it. Okay, that's not too horrendous. Yep, 
those are all soldered. Pull my blobs of oof. Yes, you see, I mentioned that it softens. That is a bit of an issue. Although as it cools, I can just dab it in there and deal with that. Okay, header pins done. Icy socket next. Uh, notch indicates that this here is pin one on this corner. There's a notch on the socket. Just to keep me honest, I'll plug that in there. Blob of this stuff on there. Thank you to Julian Eilert for introducing me to using that for my components previously. I would have just held them with my finger and burned my finger because I don't have the mass of calluses of, say, a typical large bearded Scotsman. On these lighter pins on the socket, that goes super fast. I like it. Okay. Next. And then I shouldn't need that for the components with the long leads on them. Um, what should we put in next? Well, let's start from the left side of the board now. Um, because I'm not throwing so much heat at it, because the iron's controlled, I guess I can get away with. Uh, well, I'm not going to burn components up anyway. I'm not going in there that long. And I'll just bend the lead so I don't have to use anything to hold it in place. So that's one of the two 4.7 microfarad electrolytic capacitors. The, uh, where's something to point with? Let's use the diode here. Uh, the capacitor pads, the shaded side is the negative, the positive side is marked as positive. Electrolytic capacitors are polarized. If you connect them backwards, they turn into spark generators or smoke generators, or if you're really lucky, rockets. However, since I don't want to dig into my own component stash, I will just install them the correct way. I know it's less exciting, but... Okay. And... Trim the ends of the wires nice and short. So that they're not flopping over and shorting out other components. Okay, so what else is on that? And let's start doing some resistors. According to this, we need a 1K and a 15K resistor. Um, in the parts list, there are three 1K resistors and one 15K resistor. Um, so there's two, oops, there's two groups of three resistors. So let's see, again, somebody with better eyes than mine could do this using the, uh, the, ba the color bands and the resistors, but don't do colors very well. So that is 9762, so that's basically 10K. All right, well, fine. I'll change my plan. I'm going to use these 10K resistors. They go over here. Those are our RC filters, or the resistive component of our RC filters. You could form the leads with with a tool. Don't have one. Don't feel like using pliers. The leads on these things are soft enough that it doesn't matter. Okay, just put a finger on those. Give them a quick bend. 
just to hold them while they're being soldered. And get a longer piece of solder off of my knot of solder here. Oh, come on. Close enough. This is nice and relaxing. Okay. Next, I'm just going to do all the rest of the resistors using exactly the same method. You know, identify them out of the pile of parts, put them in where they need to go, and carry on. What's next? Um, ceramic capacitors. There should be four of these 473 capacitors. Um, and there should be a 103 and a 104. This one says 104 right on it, so that's obviously the one it goes in the 104 spot. 103 it says. Let's just for giggles see what it measures at. Ninety-five fifty picofarads. And I'll just bang these guys all in. The ones with the known markings. Or at least the ones that are marked so we can tell what they are. Okay, all inserted and ready for time-lapse soldering. Okay, so I've got two capacitor or two ceramic capacitors left. Um, this one is marked 104 and has a spot right there. For anybody playing along at home, that is C5, which is this DC block capacitor for the uh, square wave output and this one is 103 which would be C9 which is where is it that's the DC block between uh, this transistors base and uh, collector Okay, what next? How about the variable resistor, which is an output level control, and the reverse protection diode for the DC input, which is such a simple thing, but really, really good idea, good design. It's not hard to implement. You lose six tenths of a volt, big deal. 
much better that you don't accidentally fry your own, your entire circuit. Well, not the entire circuit. Maybe the IC and possibly the transistors. The resist. Oh, the capacitors will care too. Those two electrolytics, especially the one that's uh, in parallel with the input. Uh, this one here, it will care if there's a reverse voltage. Um, the 555 may or may not survive. They're fairly durable, but I wouldn't want to do it. Um, the transistors, unless you're putting a stupid voltage across there, reverse biasing them shouldn't bother them too very much, but still good practice and a sign that, uh oh, what have I done? I've broken that lead right there loose. With my aggressive chopping. There. Oops. It's always good to keep an eye on what you're doing. Okay, so there's only two sets of pads unpopulated, which are the transistors. These are just fairly generic little NPN transistors. The base is the middle pin. They go into, they're just following the silk screen, which makes it super easy. You could trace it out on the back, but I'm trusting that this kit isn't leading me astray. I'm just bending the leads with my fingers. You could use pliers. You could use a little fancy lead forming tool. Pasha. This is a hobby. This isn't my business. I don't have all those tools. And even when I was a bench tech eons ago, I didn't have all those tools. I just used my fingers. Or if I want it to be nice and uniform, a pair of needly nose pliers. I'm liking this little iron. Even though it's a tiny tip, it holds its temperature quite well. I guess that's the benefit of a, a temperature controlled iron. Okay, that's everything soldered down. Give these guys a quick haircut. Okay. Time to drop the 555 in. Put that down on the bench. So now then, the notch indicates this is the end with pin one. The dot indicates pin one is that guy right there. Take a look. They're all nice and parallel and straight. So put one side's row in and Gotta bend against it to get the other ones in and chunk. Down she goes. Okie dokie. That's done. There's the four rows of pin output selector pins. And the common side of them goes to the base of this transistor, which is Q1. Okay. So I think when I was making my decision or, or my uh, description earlier, I led you astray. Um, this transistor, the base of it is taking the output from the last of the resistors in the RC in the three RC filtering circuits. So that is going to be the sine wave output goes into the base of this transistor, um, which goes to one side of J four. Now then, the other side of these four, J1234, are all going to the base of this. So whichever one you're plugged into, those aren't actually the outputs. Whichever one you're plugged into jumps the, that to the base input, for all intents and purposes, of this transistor, which has um, uh, the 100K pull-up and uh, 1K load resistor. So that is buffering and amplifying the output of whichever one of those is sent out. This 
transistor and its capacitor and resistor are amplifying the sine wave and probably cleaning them up a little bit would be my guess. I haven't done the math uh, on any of this stuff, but that's I'm guessing that's going to be tuned to whatever our frequency is going to be and it'll be sending that sine wave out J4 to be amplified by this guy and out the output if J4 is selected. Sure now then. Here's this. Okay, one battery charging later, we return. So, my test setup. I have the Wii oscilloscope hooked up to the outputs. I have my little bench power supply set for 9 volts um, powering this. Um, something else that I did, I'm not sure, yeah, in the piece of video that disappeared thanks to my battery dying, I, I had done some troubleshooting and discovered that the solder pad that I, um, too aggressively clipped earlier, I actually broke the trace underneath it. So I've added this little bodge wire or repair wire on top, which is just a piece of, uh, trimmed off component lead to replace the broken trace and it works. So clamp that back into there. Um, and I think I'm going to go back to the beginning, which you didn't see. I'll put the jumper on J1, which connects the square wave out to the the amplifier and then out. Um, turn that on and power on the silly scope from just a 9 volt battery. And we will zoom in and see what we can see. And what we can see. I put some shade on that. What we can see is a nice little square wave that's not in focus. Focus, you. Well, it's focusing on that, isn't it? There, that's better. Okay. So we have a square wave which is running at 1.9-ish kilohertz. 50% duty cycle, give or take. Although you notice that it's not perfectly 100% square. Um, that's probably just due to the cheesiness of our circuit there. Um, not too concerned about it. It's likely, likely actually caused by, um, a little bit of, uh, timing constant on the series capacitor, I'm guessing. So it's not a perfect square wave, but that's fine. Next, I'll move the jumper onto position two, which this calls a sawtooth wave. But again, down here, we're... Focus. Why won't that focus? Down here, we're seeing it. It's sort of square tooth, but it's got some curve to it, both in the rise time and fall time. Actually, that might be partially due to the AC or DC coupling on here. Well, not really. It doesn't seem to make a difference. So I guess it's a high enough frequency that it, that the AC coupling isn't an issue. Okay. Um, peak to peak voltage uh, 0.8 volts. Oh, right. Um, we can change that because oops, there's a level potentiometer on here. That one there. So I can't show you this and that at the same time, so I'll just do that. So we can increase it. Now it's saying this is 1.86 volts peak to peak. And it's off the scale of the screen. And we can reduce it down to basically below the trigger voltage. And so let's set that to there, almost exactly 1 volt peak to peak. Okay. There, it's calibrated. Bah, ha, ha. 
So now let's go from that sawtooth wave, allegedly, onto a triangle wave. Which is this one. It's much lower voltage. It's gone through another, another series resistor. Had some more harmonics stripped off by another capacitor. So we're on J3 now. And I guess if I increase the voltage, there. So now we've got a half volt peak to peak and a nice steady trigger on it. Okay, and now the fourth one, which is the sine wave. And I'm actually going to pull that that down a little bit and that down a little bit um, which are just the uh, sensitivity in the range and now we have a 0.36 volt peak to peak sine wave and just the amplitude that's max bring it down it loses at about 42 millivolts RMS. And the max we can get out of is about 126 millivolts. So, and, but that looks like a not bad sine wave, quite honestly. I was expecting it to be much crappier. If we come down a little bit, there's some goofiness in there. Um, let's slow it down or slow down the, the time base a little bit sorry speed up time base a little bit uh to one milliseconds yeah you can see it's got a little hitch in its step there but i wasn't expecting this to be a precision piece of test equipment it's just intended to be a signal source and now that i have a relatively predictable source of a sine wave at was it one point eight uh, kilohertz just under two kilohertz that should be fine for testing audio circuits um, some of those uh, amplifier modules that i got in previous mailbags so there we go um despite glitches and errors and learning new soldering tools and the battery on my camera dying all in all, I think that's a successful kit build. And this has just been added to my ultra cheap test equipment inventory, which includes, of course, the scope, the uh, component tester, the cheapest multimeter on Banggood. Um, what else have we got around here? Oh, I guess the little LED tester. Um, Another signal source, uh, just a random 555 circuit. Although, now that I've got this one as a source of square waves, I don't have to keep this one functioning, though it is variable frequency, so maybe I will. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. If you got anything to say, uh, talk to me down in the comments. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. I'm Sure, there's going to be some people criticizing my uh, my soldering skill, and that's okay, because um, I'm not in a competition here. I'm just doing this to have fun. Talk to you next week.